This conference will now be recorded. We are now being recorded. Hi, good evening, everybody. This is Joe Gallo, and w welcome to our ANCAN meeting with uh, Lindsay Blair tonight. Uh, I'm just going to do a couple of basic administrative points like I typically do for these sessions uh, to make sure that everybody's aware. The first thing that you should be aware of is that this is being recorded. If for some reason you choose not to identify yourself, you can change your name uh, or turn off your screen. Um, I would ask that everyone at this point forward, please mute yourself unless you're being specifically addressed. Uh, the questions session will begin after Lindsay's presentation. Uh, Howard and the rest of the team, Elliot, Jim, and company will uh, actually manage the questions. Put the questions into the chat. Okay. Somebody, somebody's got a lot of background going right now, and I can't quite figure out who you are at the moment. Uh, so please mute yourself. Um, put your questions into the chat. We have questions that have been submitted in advance, which Howard has. Uh, we will also try to consolidate your questions, you know, to to keep the thing moving efficiently. And uh, we'll be on on key to uh, doing a fairly good session. Uh, I think that should pretty much do it. Um, so I will uh, turn it over to Howard. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. And yeah, we we set a new record for these uh, weekly sessions. We're we're wavering between 49 and 50 people. So everyone is welcome and. I think it's the star power of our speaker, but we also invited a, a broader net of people, not just the active surveillance people, but people with uh, uh, unfavorable intermediate risk on up to high risk. And everybody is uh, always welcome. Um, any rate, and, and I wanna give a special thanks to Richard May who proposed this this uh, session um, and you know the same offer goes out to any of you if you have an idea for a topic you want covered or, or a particular speaker that you think is really good um, you know please feel free to let us know and so uh, tonight uh, our featured speaker is Lindsay Byrne and Lin Lindsay uh, is special in many ways. Uh, one of them is she's a geneticist, but a very special geneticist because she specializes in uh, prostate cancer. And uh, she's established the first genital urinary cancer genetics clinic at the Ohio State University back in 2018. And, and there, in fact, are very few clinics like this in the United States. Um, so she's involved with uh, the OSU. I don't know what their thing is about the, the OSU Genetic <laughs> Counseling Training Program is a course director, supervisor, mentoring program coach, thesis committee member, and she also will wash the pots and pans. Uh, Maybe, um, and she she trains, supervises, and so on uh, other people in the field. Uh, additionally, she's been a genetic counselor representative and on the executive committee for the state of Ohio Partners for Cancer Control since 2014, and the 2020 co-chair with the goal to create the new state cancer plan. Um, she has other things, but why don't I just turn the program to her. Uh, if, if you have questions as, as she goes along, you can feel free to enter them in the chat. When, she, when Lindsay uh, finishes, I'll ask a few questions and then we'll s see what we have in the chat box. But at any rate, uh, Lindsay, it's all yours. Okay. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I these are my favorite types of talks to actually up close as well as close as we can be tonight so to say 
due to our lovely friend COVID with the individuals who are living this and can help benefit and under, understand the most. So I put my email address and my Twitter handle on my page in case, you know, you feel like you want to ask me a question later and you don't want to bring it up in front of everybody else. I'm happy to answer that later. Um, you know, if you follow me on Twitter, I do tweet about cancer and GU cancers, prostate cancer, important things, but I also tweet about sports sometimes too. Um, I'm from St. Louis, so I like the Cardinals and the Blues, so that's my disclaimer. So I can't, <laughs> I can't tell you to not look at my tweets if you don't like those things. So I apologize. I also want to give a, a quick disclaimer. It is eight o'clock at my house when my kids get ready for bed and we have a quarantine puppy. So I'm hoping all goes quiet. And if it does, you might get to meet some other people tonight if not. So we'll get started. So what I want to do today is discuss who is appropriate to see a genetic counselor, explain genetics and the relationship to prostate cancer, describe genetic counseling in the testing process, and then I want to share a patient example from clinic. So when I say that I'm a genetic counselor, most people think that I analyze DNA like a counselor like this. But really, what I really do is spend about an hour with patients and take a very detailed amount of time to go through one family history. You know, my part of the GU cancer team is really being able to take that time to go through questions and analyze things that have not been done by anybody else on the team. So I will ask lots of questions. And the purpose is, as I'm looking for a pattern, I'm looking to see if there's anything that I'm more concerned that something hereditary is going on. Throughout my appointment, I also discuss you know, cancer genetics, explaining what genetic testing is, all the questions that one has about that, what it means for them, what testing looks like for them, their family, how this works, how do test results interpret, meaning what, what those results would be, the types of results that we can get. Is there any research studies that I would recommend based off of what I'm seeing within them and their family? And also, as you guys know more than I do, cancer is can bring a lot of stressful and difficult discussions and it can make things complicated. And so I have training to help individuals along the way to navigate what type of information that genetics can bring up for families because sometimes people just don't wanna share that information with their relatives. But once we find out that something's positive, that information could impact family members. So that's why I spend so much time during my appointment and block time because there's just a lot to cover. And I do feel like there's this myth and idea in the population that you just need to get your blood drawn as a 15 minute thing and zing, zing, zang, zoom, we're done. Not quite true. So really what I do is I trans, translate complex genetic information into something that's much more understandable. So when should genetic counseling be considered? Well, I feel like there's really two answers to this. So the physicians that I work with think the priority of doing genetic testing is when results will change medical management. And this can fall into a category for patients who have metastatic prostate cancer and they're searching for treatment therapies. You know, this summer there was a, a couple of therapies that have been now associated with hereditary cancer. And so individuals, if they test positive for particular mutations, they're eligible for therapies and they tend to do better. So that's the big reason why physicians are thinking about it. But the way that I view my job is really I'm thinking about the patient and their family. And patients come to me wanting to know, why did this happen and why do I have so much cancer in my family? And wanting to understand, am I at risk for other cancers? Do I need to worry about a second type of cancer? Do, does my son, does my daughter need to worry about cancer based off my diagnosis? Those are the biggest reasons that patients come to me outside of thinking about, could this change any of their current prostate cancer treatment? Sometimes they see patients who have had previous genetic testing and they just 
want to talk a little bit more in depth about them or maybe they had testing in say like 2000 there's a whole lot of differences that have happened with our genetic test results and what techniques and um, how we can test now that I would offer potentially updated testing at that point. So really, I want to go take a step back historically. This paper came out in 2016, and this is the paper that really got things going for prostate cancer genetics. So back in 2016, I actually was still seeing more general cancer patients. So, and really what that included mostly was breast. Breast cancer genetics is really the first and most known for genetic testing and genetic counseling. But what this paper said is that Pritchard et al. found that individuals who had metastatic prostate cancer, regardless of age, regardless of family history, there was a 12% chance to have a hereditary mutation or a hereditary finding. That was huge. And more data now has been looking at prostate cancer across the board, not just metastatic. We're looking at you know, lower risk, sleep and AIDS, all, all different types of prostate cancer, because now the light bulb has said, well, wait a minute, we haven't been focusing on prostate cancer all this time there's there's risk there and we knew there was risk but we just didn't realize how high so this paper along a couple other papers i'm sure had to do with why osu decided to recruit someone like me and then i got to osu in 2018. so also historically and hopefully you guys know what nccn guidelines are but they're the national comprehensive cancer network guidelines that's how we treat how we monitor how we guide individuals based off of cancer treatment. And when I started my job at OSU, I knew about option three on here for the NCCN guidelines. So the genetic familial high risk assessment, breast ovarian and pancreatic is the guideline that the genetic counselors use the most. But I realized when I started working specifically in prostate that there were two other areas that NCCN had guidelines for. But the tricky part was, is that they all, did not say the same thing in regards to hereditary prostate cancer. So first off, prostate cancer early detection didn't mention anything about thinking about genetics. The prostate cancer specific NCCN guideline was saying that if people had a BRCA mutation, they should start prostate cancer screening at age 40. But the one that I was most familiar with was saying 45. So we weren't even on the same lines across the board in regards to what we are recommending individuals. So then really a beautiful thing happened. There was a meeting that started in 2017 where physicians, providers, patients, genetic counselors, and stakeholders from all over came together to Philadelphia and formed the Philadelphia Prostate Cancer Consensus. And this meeting was was truly the energy in this meeting was was really great it was everybody in the room who had to do with genetics and had to do with prostate cancer or really wanted everyone to get on the same page so what happened at the meeting in 2019 i was there and it was it was great all three of the chairs of those nccn guidelines were there and got up together and sat in chairs together and said oh it's time for us to get on the same page. We're all saying different things. So, you know, every time I think about this moment, it was like a milestone and this baby just like sums it up for me to say, yes, we did it. We're getting somewhere. We're all on the same page. So now we can tackle this and we can push the way that we think about prostate cancer genetics forward. So I just wanted to show you quickly an example from each of the guidelines where genetic testing is listed now and how it's just on, everybody's on the same page. It's just really great. So I highlighted here just so you can see that, you know, the higher the risk group for prostate cancer, the more likely that we would recommend without family history. But again, and I know most of the folks here tend to be more maybe in the low, maybe intermediate, but that's where the family history and my part of my job can be super important. So if you look at the guideline that I'm most familiar with that we had talked about that familial high risk, this is where that family history spells out a little bit more. 
but I included, and we'll get to it in a, in a few slides of what where that family history is and as, as a summary slide of who I'd recommend. But just to show you, you know, once you have any risk group, that's when you start adding some family history. And then in that prostate cancer early detection section, there's a special note here about thinking about genetics. So this is really great. So if anybody is looking through anything associated with prostate cancer and the national recommendations, they will see it. So again, here's that slide that I was telling you about that who I created for my clinic who's appropriate. Um, you know, my first bullet here says prostate cancer diagnosed at age 55 or younger. So there was no bullet on any of those recommendations that I just listed from NCCN that said this, this type of information. There's no age related. However, I'm, I'm still not convinced that when you're diagnosed young that this couldn't be associated with genetics. The way that we think about genetics as genetic counselors and cancer, typically the younger the age of diagnosis with a cancer tends to be more hereditary. However, the data that we have found with prostate cancer so far really doesn't fit that bill if the person is young and the cancer is low grade and there's no family history. So if somebody's young and then it's more aggressive, because of the more aggressive, that feature tends to be more genetic. But I'm not giving up. I still feel like the date, we haven't done enough data searching on this. And so I still am recommending it. And I have my doctors in our clinic recommend those patients to me. Because honestly, what I find that once I start talking to men about this topic, they are interested, even if the chance is really low for me to find something hereditary, because it does give that relief to say, okay, I've checked all these boxes, I've ruled this out for my family, I'm feeling really good about being able to do all the right things for, for my care, for my future health, and for the health of my family. So the other categories are listed, metastatic, Gleason 8 or higher. Once you have that lower Gleason, type, Gleason score, that's when we start adding some other factors in. Individuals who have Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry have a higher chance to have particular hereditary findings because that population tends to stay within that population and thus that increases chances for genetic risk. So a collection of these types of cancers and in individuals as well. The one thing to point out, just because somebody is interested in genetic counseling, it does not mean they have to do genetic testing. So there's no criteria that you have to have to have genetic counseling, I always promote people if, if they want to get information and learn more about this, then seek out a genetic counselor, go see them. And then if genetic testing is appropriate for you, then the counselor will talk about that. And then cost and insurance coverage will come into play in regards to the testing. And the last bullet that I'll mention here of who's appropriate to, to come in for counseling and come in for testing is if an individual's had tumor genetic testing or testing on your prostate cancer tissue, and there's been a finding or a mutation in a gene like BRCA1 or 2 on a foundation medicine report. So we like to offer germline testing or testing for what I do in, in genetics to make sure that, that that change is not present in every cell in the body. Okay, so let's get in to the actual genetics. So even though all cancer is genetic, so what that means is if you look at the cells of cancer, there are mutations and your, your cancer is a mutation, thus that's genetic. But most cancer is not inherited or hereditary. Most of it is sporadic or happens by chance because aging is our highest risk factor for cancer. When we look at cancer from a breast perspective, from a lung, from any cancer, most cancers we see happen 60 and older. But my area of specialty is that 5 to 10% hereditary category. So that's where the genetic testing comes in. What the familial category is, is I will test people who have a couple of cases of prostate cancer in them but they test negative for all these hereditary genes that I know of, but there's still this clustering of cancer. So clearly there's still shared risk in the family, but I can't pinpoint any underlying 
cause at this point. So that's the category of familial. So why is there such a high percentage of prostate cancer that's sporadic? Is because men have a high chance to have prostate cancer, 12%, one in eight men. So, and it's the third most common cancer in the, with 11% of all new cancers. So it's very common as you guys probably know way more than I do. So thinking about that familial category, this slide gives us an understanding and shows us that there is still increased risk, even if genetic testing is negative. So for example, if you had a brother who had prostate cancer, we're finding that there's a 3.14 more likely chance to have prostate cancer than if you did not have a brother with prostate cancer. So trying to zone in on additional risk factors, and that's, that's where we in genetics are looking at, okay, we know that there's these genes that have a high hereditary risk, but there's other pieces to it, and we're still trying to dig a little bit further. And so there, there is still more to this picture. To the right, I included just as a reference that the American Cancer Society guidelines to show you that even if genetics is negative, and there is family history, we still recommend younger screening for unaffected relatives. Um, that is super important because I think sometimes that sons and brothers will still think that they need to just start prostate cancer at age 50, especially if genetics is negative. And I always, always stress that if there's a, a cancer type in the family and age is younger, we need to be preventative even if genetic testing is negative. So I mentioned this a couple times, but I just want to say that, like I said, all cancer is genetic, thus mutations are that are in your cancer. So again, my specialty is in the germline area here. And I wanted to just briefly mention again what somatic genetic testing is. Somatic genetic testing is done to look for treatment options, and this this would be a great topic for you guys to have someone come talk about it. Um, it would be a whole talk, but I'm going to continue talking about germline testing because this is the testing that we look for where the mutations are present in every cell in the body, which can be done by blood or saliva. So I'm going to keep it very basic, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So when we think about our cells and we look in that cell, that's where our chromosomes are. Our chromosomes are made up a long strand of that DNA, and a gene is a segment of DNA, and the DNA is made up those four letters, A, a C, G, and T. And fun genetic fact is really, we're all only different by four letters, which is really, truly amazing. And typically, what our gene does is to create a protein, and that protein then protects our body. So when we go down to those letters, what we're talking about when I say mutation or a change in your genetics, it's really a change in what happens in an A to T or a G to C is changed. I give you this example to show you that when the DNA is normal and everything is, is going well, the sentence reads clearly. But once one of the letters is, is changed around or switched around, this is when things get a little bit out of whack, and that's when cancer and other genetic health conditions can happen. So really, to summarize this part, when I send somebody sample for genetic testing, the lab is actually analyzing and looking for changes in your genes to see if there's any mutations that could have caused your prostate cancer. So I wanna take a minute to just walk you through what I typically do. Again, just to quickly summarize. Again, I go through and take a family tree, a family history. We talk about the risks, benefits, and limitations of testing because there's, there's a lot to cover. You know, just because your test is negative, it doesn't mean that you're going to never get cancer, especially when I talk to patients who have family history and don't have a personal history. I can never guarantee that. I can tell an individual that the chance 
for a hereditary associated cancer is low, but there's still general population for risk for cancers. So we cover a lot of a lot of information during our appointment. Um, but the biggest thing, if you remember anything from my talk today, just remember this and share this with your friends and your friends' friends because I spend most of my time outside of my office debunking genetic myths at barbecues at, well, when I used to go to those things, but <laughs> on phone calls and people email me. But this is, this is the truly the misinformation that people think out there that is, is prohibiting people from learning about their genetics if they want to know. So the first one is for men, men don't think that they can inherit cancer from their mother's side of the family, which is wrong. Half of all men with hereditary risk inherit it from their mother. So you inherit half your risk from mom and half from dad. And even if, because your mom doesn't have male parts, doesn't mean you can't inherit risk that can be associated with that. People are super afraid of insurance and cost. So <clears throat> I'm gonna group these two together because cost should not be a barrier to receiving care. Cost is such a barrier in our country, and I feel like we have come so far in genetic testing and counseling that we have made it to where it just isn't a barrier at this point. Um, if somebody were to have to pay out of pocket um, for genetic testing, we find that it is, is very cost effective and less than a couple hundred bucks. Um, I don't, and a lot of people in my field don't actually bill for their appointment. So I actually don't bill for my appointments. That's probably something I shouldn't announce and like record, but we, we in our field and Ohio state and other hospitals find our services so important and so valuable that we're not billing for them because we aren't recognized by Medicare to, to bill at this point, which is a whole nother talk. But Genetic counseling and genetic testing are definitely covered very well. And the other thing is people are really, really afraid of being discriminated against by their genetic testing. There are laws in place that protect against this from your health insurance and employment. And this is a law called GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. It protects from those pieces. And the, the only disclaimer that I have about GINA is that it does not protect against life insurance. So I do have discussions about life insurance and pieces about that before we decide to test to make sure everybody is on the same page about that. So once testing is decided that somebody wants to go ahead and do, again, it's done by blood or a spit sample. Results take about two to three weeks. I typically mail them out to California. There's a couple labs that I like to use there. And like I mentioned, cost is, is very cost effective. So if insurance doesn't recognize prostate cancer as a criteria or a, a person that I'm seeing does not meet coverage, they could choose to do self-pay for $250. So we have found that reasonable compared to when I first started in this field, it was about $5,000. Um, we come a long way. And then, um, you know, with that piece, most of the time patients really only pay $100 for testing or it's covered 100%. So I just wanted to give you a, a taste of some of the genes that are associated. I wanted to stay a little more broad tonight um, and not dig too, too deep into the genes, but to the left is a list of 12 genes from a particular prostate cancer panel. Um, these genes have been um, added to this list over time and these are the most common. Of course, as more data comes out, more genes are added. I tend to order a panel that looks at 14 or even I include other genes as well. But um, the bar graph to the right shows you the genes that test positive the most frequently. So with that said, I wanna focus a little bit more on BRCA1 and 2 or BRCA2 was the one that you saw that was was found to be positive the most frequently in prostate cancer. So these two genes are associated with a condition called hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. And so right away, that is a problem for the fact that there are many of us in the field who have said, can we rename this condition? 
clearly there's prostate cancer risk, clearly there's pancreatic cancer risk. Why is it called HVOC and not given the recognition of other cancer risk, which is misleading, right? It's very misleading. And so, yes, in the beginning, breast and ovarian cancer were the gene cancers that were most known, but we've learned so much and we need to change the name. So that was my quick soapbox. So I'll get down. But um, this is a common, common condition. BRC1 and 2 mutations are very common in the population. One in 40 people who have Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry are found to, to be positive. They have three very particular mutations. If a man tests positive for BRCA2, what we would recommend for them is to make sure they're getting a, a breast exam and are performing self-breast exams starting at age 35, and then prostate cancer screening starts at age 40. For pancreatic cancer screening, it's, we only make recommendations if there's family history. And for melanoma, there's not NCCN guidelines that say do skin cancer screening, but I tell my patients, I don't think it's harmful for you to see a dermatologist yearly to do a skin exam. Okay, let's go through what the results look like. So results can be positive, negative, or what we call a variant of uncertain significance, or I call it an in-between result. So if you test positive, that means I found something in your genetics that is most likely associated with your cancer risk. And I say most likely because if we do a broader test that looks at other cancer risk outside of prostate, I could find something that has other cancer risk and not really been found to be associated with prostate cancer. But if you're found to be positive, then we talk about what that means for, for you, what it means for your family, because now they have a 50% chance to also have the same finding. So for sons and daughters and siblings, that's when we start talking about testing family members. So if you test negative, it truly, it truly depends on if the person who tests negative has a diagnosis of cancer or does not, meaning that sometimes I will test individuals who come in for family history of cancer and the other relative is has a higher chance to be hereditary than that person. And so I would want to test, say, mom or dad to say, well, what if mom did test positive and you just happen to have tested negative? That's more helpful than just starting to test an individual and they're negative. Um, but in general, if a negative test result is fine, we then look at the family history to help guide us and personal history as to what, we, what recommendations we will make for that family. And then for the unknown results or the in-between results, what this means is that we found a change in a gene, but we just don't know if there's enough data to say that it's truly positive or associated with cancer risk, or it's just a normal change about you that makes you different from me. Um, sometimes we pick up these types of findings because we're covering a lot of territory. We're looking at a lot of genetic findings, and we just, as, as a society, don't have enough information yet. So typically, I treat these as a negative because most of the time, over time, they will get reclassified in that direction, but it really depends on what I see within that patient and with that family. And then after, after results, are received, I do these by phone, and we really dig into it over the phone about any questions that you have after we have found the results, what it means for them, what it means for your family, if there's any additional testing, any research. <clears throat> do they, are they mad? Are they, do they feel relieved? What are their thoughts? How are they gonna talk to it, talk about this with their family? Like we, we really get into anything that, as, that a patient wants to talk about. Okay, I want to spend these last few minutes just walking you through a patient that I saw, and hopefully that helps you to truly visualize what this process looks like. So this is a typical family history that I take, and we actually call the family history a pedigree, and men are squares and females are circles, just to orient you here. And the little triangle, the, the little triangle is showing you the person that I saw in the clinic. So this young man was diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer at 53, which with that alone made him appropriate for genetic testing. But as I took his family history, it definitely became more and more suspicious because his mom had very young breast cancer. There's another prostate cancer 
on his, and his cousin a little bit later in life. And he, he wasn't the best historian because there were three men with cancer, but he just didn't know what types of cancer. And um, on, <laughs> on his dad's side of the family, it was a very small family, and his grandmother died very young of, of some type of cancer as well. So the other piece of this puzzle that I had up front was that his medical oncologist had done that tumor testing because he was searching for therapy options. And when, as soon as I looked at this report, I thought, oh, I'm going to find a BRCA2 mutation in this guy because I see it right here on his report. And this is a part of educating the physicians that I work with and I work with in the community because this is really complicated to understand. But that's why it's helpful to have me or have a genetic counselor on the team because we understand this. So I knew before I even took his family history, I'm really concerned about this. But the really important thing to keep in mind is I actually did a full large test because you never want to just test for the one finding you see on a somatic test because that type of test is not designed to pick up all the germline mutation. So this guy was found to have two pathogenic or positive results. Um, and then the unknown result, which we're not going to worry about because I would I ignored it because he has two findings. So he did have that same BRCA2 finding that was picked up on his, his tumor. But he also had this check 2 finding, which was not listed at all on his, on his tumor. And the tricky part is, is that, well, his cancer could have not been driven by the check 2 mutation. And so that's why it wasn't in there. But it should be present in every cell in his body. So the question is, is that did that test just not have the technology to pick it up and the germline testing is more deep, which is probably the case. So um, the, the really interesting thing about this as well, let me go back to his family history, is that BRCA2 mutation is actually very specific to being French Canadian, which he has French Canadian ancestry on his mom's side. Um, and when we get a test result, we can't tell which side of the family one inherited a mutation from. So, you know, I always start to speculate, but of course, we would always want to test both sides of the family for both mutations. So my speculation is that he inherited the BRCA2 mutation from mom's side and the CHECK2 mutation from dad's side. He could have inherited both from the same side. I can't tell that in, until he starts having relatives start testing. So, and that CHECK2 mutation is actually an extremely common CHECK2 mutation that we have a ton of data on. So, um, that's another thing when it comes to genetics is, are the mutations that we're finding in individuals, have they been seen a lot? How much data do we have on those? So, with that said, I know we already talked about BRCA2 and the cancers associated. I just wanted to mention a little bit about CHECK2 just so you have that information. So, this gene is really most known as a breast cancer gene. So. The interesting thing is, is BRCA2 and CHEC2 have female cancer risk associated with it. If you remember, and I'll flip back to his family history, he had two very young daughters. So this is extremely important for his kids. And if I would have just tested for the finding that was in his tumor, we would have completely missed this. So the biggest change for, for the guy that I saw is there are colon cancer recommendations for CHEC2 mutations. So I am recommending that he has a colonoscopy more frequently because we do see a slight increase there. There is some data associated with prostate cancer in CHECK2, but it's just still very unclear at this point. So again, I just wanted to show you this one more time now that we've talked about this. So he has two very, very young daughters. And um, what do we do now? So I've talked to him, I've talked to his wife multiple times talking about, you know, when is it appropriate to start testing my kids? They're extremely young. So for BRCA2, the earliest breast cancer screening starts at 25. So what I always say is trying to find that balance of letting a kid be a kid and making sure they test right before we would start doing screening as if they were positive. And they felt comfortable about that because one of their daughters is in college and lives further away and they just weren't ready to have those conversations yet and talk about that. 
check if they so let's say they test positive for check two and not BRCA two. You know, the breast cancer screening recommendations are a little bit later, so they could start closer to age 30. So we would just th then decide when we would, you know, start testing them then at that point. So I just wanted to share this case because it seemed like from at the beginning it was going to be very straightforward, and then of course it became a little bit more complicated, which genetics tends to do. <laughs> so I wanted to mention just a little bit about family genetic testing, that once I do find mutations that are known, there is free testing. All the labs like to offer free testing for 90 days, and that's a really nice perk that they give. Um, but really, sometimes having free testing just because it's free isn't always the best answer, because for those two girls, that would mean they would have had to already have tested, and it just isn't the right timing for them, and we need to figure out when the timing is right and when works out for their thinking about life insurance. And I do spend a lot of time helping patients track down genetic counselors in other states and other places because all families don't live in Ohio when they live there as well. So with that said, I know I covered a lot of information. I will take questions at this point and thank you very much. And let me exit out of this so I can see everybody again. Okay, well, th thank you, Lindsay. And uh, I want, want to tell the audience that Lindsay has a hard stop at 9.30 Eastern. She's, she's got to take care of other folks than us. But I, I'm going to kick it off with a couple of questions. Um, what, what is the value of testing from companies such as 23andMe versus the companies that I tend to work for or just in no, general? I mean, a lot of people get this sort of testing. They're interested in their family tree. Yeah. But, you know, a side benefit or a marketing benefit with some of the companies is they also do genetic testing of a health nature with it. And I, you right. know, you know, how valuable is that information? If I, I know, you know, like I, I took such testing years ago and they, they said that I, you know, I was, uh, you know, I didn't have the, the BRCA mutation, for example. So can I trust that or do, do I have to go and 23 to me? Well, I don't want to just pick them out, but for example, oh, okay. right. Yes. So, th no, this is a great question, and I should add this to my myth debunking page, but it's gotten so tight that I maybe need to add a new page. So 23, 23 and me is, is good to get a little bit of health information. So if you're one who's thinking about um, health information and just want a little bit of a glimpse into like heart disease or other pieces, it's a good test. But if you are specifically concerned about cancer risk or you've been diagnosed with a cancer, getting full genetic testing from a genetic counselor is a better way to go. And the reason why is the difference of what's being tested on 23andMe versus what is tested when I do genetic testing. So I'm doing full sequencing of genes. So looking letter by letter through the entire gene. So the BRCA test result that's on 23andMe only looks at those three Jewish mutations. So again, three mutations versus thousands that are possible that I would test for. So it's not a full test report from that perspective, and it does just give you a little glimpse. So I do worry that people take that kind of testing and feel like it's a complete test. But I do think it also on the, the good end of it, it does let people become aware that, oh, this is showing that I may be at increased risk for heart disease or some other things, and maybe they decide to be proactive. But if you're truly worried about a particular health issue, health issue or something, you need to make sure that you're going to a health provider that, spe that specifically specializes in that. Hopefully that helps answer that question. Right. Well, we have, we've had a couple of questions. 
ha having to do with uh, variants. Um, and one, one a person asks, can you explain that even with the major mutations, such as Lynch and BRCA, you can still have variants? And, you know, how should patients react to that? And, you know, along a similar route here is a question, if a patient has a variant, what follow-up is needed and are patients notified of reclassifications? Okay, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So, first of all, I'll, I'll tackle the reclassification part. So, if if somebody is told that they have a variant of unknown significance and I saw them, the companies that I use do reclassify those results and do update the provider who ordered them and thus I then update the patient. I can't answer that for whoever asked that specifically because I don't know who ordered the test and what company. Most companies follow that same protocol but if you are the whoever asked that question, if you have a VUS and you want to know if it's been reclassified and let's say you got testing a few years ago, I'd reach out to that provider to ask them any updates on your test results. Um, what I tell my patients who have the unknown result category is I will contact you once I get additional information about that unknown result. But I don't mind if you want to contact me every six months, just shoot me an email and say where things are. I will reach out to a lab and say, how many cases have you seen with the same results since I last saw you? And I'm happy to update you that in that detail, but usually I don't update patients that in that much detail until I have a reclassification. And so I think the, I may have to like re-ask the part about the other piece of that question. So yeah, sure. are you asking that if you have an unknown result and have Lynch syndrome, like you're told well, you have Lynch syndrome, but have an unknown result? Well, I think the idea is to explain that if you have a major mutation, uh, oh, okay. such as Lynch or BRCA, can you okay. still have a variant? Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that example that I showed at the end, that person had a BRCA mutation and then they had that VUS or unknown result in that MBN gene that I didn't really talk too much about. That actually happens quite frequently because, you know, that even makes it stronger that I'm less worried about that unknown result because I found a reason why that cancer has happened. So sometimes, like I said, I treat those unknown results more like background noise. So if we're fishing and we are looking at this much DNA, sometimes we're going to find things that are not important. And once I find a positive result, that's where we tend to focus our energy. Hopefully that better answered that. Howard, Howard, can I just clarify a little bit? Um, sure. Lindsay, what, I, what I wanted you to get at is that we could have a BRCA mutation that is a variant of unknown significance or an ATM mutation that is a variant of unknown significance. So just because you have BRCA doesn't necessarily mean it's actionable because it could be a BRCA that's a VUS or an ATM that's a VUS. And I just wanted you to clarify that for, for Thank for the you. Audience. No, I'm glad you clarified. Yes, so the unknown, the variants or the VUS results can happen in any gene. So they can be in these common concerning, more concerning genes like BRCA2, BRCA1, ATM, the genes that are we're hearing the most about from prostate cancer. The hardest part about that is those are the genes that we're most worried about because they can be actionable in regards to treatment and therapies. So I usually watch those very closely. I ask the lab a lot of follow-up questions to say, are we really sure that this isn't disease causing or positive right now? Um, so I encourage you if, if you're in that category to ask your provider who ordered that testing a lot of questions about it and stay very, in relationship with that person. If it's like someone like me or if it's your medical oncologist who ordered it. And sometimes, and what I have learned from medical oncology, sometimes they will put you on therapy if you have a VUS in one of those genes. So that's a, a little bit separate than what I'm saying because I don't start testing family members when there's a VUS result, regardless of what gene it's in. 
Yeah, I, I can remember years ago that uh, some physicians would do these pedigree charts, which you know are basically family trees. You know, when when has the the genetic testing really kind of you know come into play? Is it just in more recent years, like the last five years, or longer ago? <laughs> So prostate cancer specifically, you know, so I've been practicing since 2008. Yeah. I've seen more prostate cancer patients in the last two years in my entire career. And that's truly because the data is finally being looked at. I would say 2016 and on is when prostate cancer genetics has started taking off. And there's, there's just so much more to, to know and learn about it at this point. Um, I'm trying to look into more of the, the people who test negative, but there's this clustering of family history, and I'm trying to look at smaller genetic risk factors to see if that has something that we can learn about and understand. And that's looking at very tiny risk factors and a collection of risk factors versus what we've talked about today one one change in a gene that can cause high risk. So trying to look at multifactorial smaller risk. But that's just not ready for prime time yet. <laughs> you know, from from your clinic, um, in your experience, is it does it come to us is it a surprise to to the men who come to see you that their that their daughters, for example, you know, might be getting actionable information? Yes. Um, I think a large part of my job is just educate, educating and saying that, you know, genetics is shared with your daughters and your sons and your mom and your dad. And, you know, this is super important. And so I think typically after I meet with individuals and talk through it, they have learned a lot and are really thankful that they have thought about this information and if even if they don't test, they have learned what this can mean, and maybe it's something they want to do later down the road or or not. But yes, it it is a little bit surprising most of the time because they're really thinking about prostate cancer and not that this could have risk for breast cancer. Right. You know, maybe maybe you could talk a little bit about the Lynch syndrome. Yep. I, yeah, I didn't put any slides about that, but that is also a very common condition that prostate cancer is associated with. Um, BRCA or HBOC is the most common, but we also see prostate cancer and Lynch syndrome, or it used to be called HMPCC. So if you've heard of that terminology before, um, Lynch syndrome is most known for colon cancer and in women endometrial cancer, and ovarian cancer. And so when I see family histories with prostate cancer and a lot of G, GI type cancers and, and female cancers, I'm thinking a little bit more about Lynch syndrome than I am something like um, BRCA1 and 2. But the, my approach when I see patients is I, I typically always offer what I call a panel of genes. So I'm always covering Lynch syndrome, and I always am covering BRCA1 and 2 when I when I see patients, and I'm covering all those, so it's the spectrum of, of genes to make sure we're not missing anything. Individuals <clears throat> who are found to have Lynch syndrome, we recommend much, much younger colonoscopies and more frequent colonoscopies, so we recommend them one to two years versus 10 years is what we typically recommend in the general population. And um, we recommend them they start those colonoscopies at 25. So there is much younger intervention for colon cancer risk with individuals who have Lynch syndrome, as well as some other other pieces that we recommend from the female side as well. Now, are there any guidelines that recommend um, genetic testing for men with prostate cancer? For example, BRCA2. You know, if, you know, one of the leaders in this field, I think, had suggested at a conference recently and mentioned that he did this with his patients considering active surveillance. 
that they all undergo uh, tests for BRCA2 mutations. But are there any formal guidelines that recommend that? So there's, there's formal guidelines for prevention, which is frustrating. So once you're diagnosed, there isn't anything to say nationally. So I think the person that you're talking about is probably researching it and looking into it, which is great because we need more data on that to say, okay, if you have a BRCA2 mutation and you were diagnosed, so are you, are you saying someone who's diagnosed or someone who's unaffected? Either Somebody who, who's just been diagnosed. Okay. Uh, With a yeah, low for, grade, like a low yeah. Gleason score. Okay. Yep. So I think that is an active area of research and I, I can't wait to see data to say, okay, these people who are BRCA2 positive, we did active surveillance in this subset of patients and we decided to do prostatectomy on this subset of patients who had better survival. What did it look like? Um, there are no there are no guidelines at this point doing that. The only guidelines are for screening before you have a diagnosis and then treatment of prostate cancer, not hereditary cancer. Like there's no distinguishing features except if you are metastatic and are eligible for certain therapies. Hopefully right. to, to be coming soon. <laughs> right. Well, in fact, uh, the researcher who was talking about this uh, is Dr. Klotz from uh, Toronto. And I noticed that we have, uh, I noticed at least a couple of uh, Canadian uh, men in the audience. And, you know, what, what is their situation, as far as you know, in terms of insurance coverage for genetic testing? Is it? Um, <laughs> I don't know the specifics. They may be more inclined to answer that other than it's different um, than what we deal, deal with in the U.S. And I don't know how large of testing you get options for. I do have colleagues in Canada, but I haven't kept up frequently to know like what they're offering and if you have to be eligible and what their criteria is for that piece, but is definitely unique. And so to all my fellow Canadians on here, I would reach out to a genetic counselor if this is something you're interested in to get those very specific details for you specifically. And yeah, I do, do recall Dr. Klotz saying that for those of his patients, well, he, he recommends that they, at a minimum, get a test. I think it's called the color test. And I think, okay. it, you know, he, he recommends, I think, two different versions of it. One of them is very basic and one has more markers. And I, you know, this is from memory, but I think the cost was somewhere between 100 to $250 Canadian. So maybe there's some Canadians in the audience who could clarify. You guys are off. So color, color is a good company. Um, so that's a great test to do. And 250 is the, in the self-pay cost for many of the companies I use in the U.S. as well. And color is a, a choice that I, I could use. The reason I don't typically use color is just because I have some relationship with the lab that I can get some additional research studies and extra bonus things that I like to be able to offer um, as perks. So, um, yeah, color is a good choice. I have, I have a couple of questions. One from the audience. Uh, the question was, if recently diagnosed, is genetic testing potentially useful in making treatment decisions? For example, surgery versus radiation. Yeah, yeah. so I just covered that a little bit, but there isn't any straightforward guidance. I think if a person is found to have one of the higher risk hereditary findings, like a BRCA2 or BRCA1 or ATM or, you know, another finding that we have a lot of data on. I think that's so tough because we just don't know right now. And honestly, I'd, I'd want to have an honest conversation with that patient and loop in their surgeon or whoever their primary physician is, depending on what the Gleason score is and how likely their you know, chance to, to recur and to, to, to be concerning. There's nothing straightforward right now. And that's 
the best I can give you. <laughs> I, I had a can. Um, can, can I can I jump? Uh, this is Rick Davis. Hi, Lindsay. Hi. I'll, uh, Hi there. I'll turn my camera on. I, I'd like to jump in on that one because um, we we lost a very very dear person to ANCAN, um, Professor Bill Burhans, um, who was a, genet a yeast geneticist at Roswell Park. Um, and he had a BRCA mutation, a uh, germline, um, and it had not just um, treatment implications, um, but it had horrible family implica implications for him, which, which I won't get into here. Um, but he was of the opinion that um, that when you have some of these um, uh, HHR and and um, similar mutations that interfere with the reproduction of the cell that you can have exacerbated effects from radiation therapy and there is there is a body okay. of work going on right now that is looking into that and men with with certain mutations in the BRCA pathway like ATM um, there may be reason to think that that's a disadvantage to getting radiation. Now, Bill, and this is purely anecdotal, had horrible side effects from his radiation. Um, and for the last several years of his life, he, he lived with a catheter and, and the catheter wasn't the problem, but the persistent UTIs were a problem. So um, our recommendation when we hear this and we talk to guys is, Please, if you do have a BRCA mutation or, or, or an ATM mutation or a similar mutation in that pathway, to please discuss it with your radiation therapist. No, I'm glad you brought that up because you're all right. There is, there is data. It's, I just think it's still a little bit anecdotal, like you said. And so I yeah. think that's where that's where my part about having a heart to heart conversation about, you know, weighing the pieces because I'm waiting for that data to be really clear and it's just, it's not completely there yet. So I Agreed. thank you for bringing that up. I think that's a good point for sure. And I just saw your note in the chat as well about USPSTS guidelines. And I do think, you know, that's a really good point too, because that is such a mess with the screening as well. And it's been a while since I thought about that. And so I, I do I do wonder if that's caused some issues for sure. Um, and it causes confusion of when to start screening and what to do, you know, the conflicting answer of like 50 versus don't do it. And right. yeah, I, I agree with you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, thanks. I have a, another question um, having to sure. do since this is an active, in generally an active surveillance. Uh, no, class, you're fine. No, perfect. Is that is that is there are there recommendations? I was actually in a trial to, and I got genetically tested because they were oh. checking. You know, I think they're trying to figure out it doesn't make sense to to genetically right. test men on AS. But I think that's my question to you: is what are your what's your opinion on that? And so my comment in my presentation about young age, and I'm not truly convinced that young age isn't associated. That's why I, I still think a little bit outside the box of where NCCN is saying that people should get genetic testing because I just don't think we've looked at enough people with prostate cancer for us to completely know that. Um, what I would say if anybody is in active surveillance and is interested in this topic and has any family history of cancer, I would encourage you to get genetic counseling. You could always get genetic counseling and talk in detail about the testing and if the testing would cost you out of pocket and you wanna do it, I always offer the test even if there's out of pocket costs if a patient is interested. There's, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, it's, it's personal choice to do the test. It can provide good information. And I agree with you, I still think we're still trying to learn who truly 
should be getting testing because there's been some studies look, saying that everybody should, all prostate cancers should. Um, and some providers don't believe that. I, like I said, if you come in to see me, I will offer testing to you. It just depends on whether insurance would cover it or not at that point. Thanks. Rick? Yeah, thank you. So, um, Lindsay and, and everybody who's listening, um, I, I just want to say that we are super sensitive to inherited cancers, not, not because of just Professor Bill, but um, our the chair of our board, Peter Kapka, lives with um, Lynch syndrome, uh, MSH6. And um, we have a number of people with advanced cancer that have BRCA mutations. Um, so last year we did a webinar um, called The Talk. And the idea of the talk, and Jim Schrate, who's in the audience today, was, was part of that. And the idea of the talk was that men with prostate cancer speak to members of their family um, about their disease. And we had four different pairs of Oh, Elliot was there too. I forgot, of course, Elliot was there too with the star of the show, his 17-year-old Julian. So um, the moderator was Alicia Morgans, Dr. Alicia Morgans, who's a GU medical oncologist at Northwestern. And um, we had two pairs of people, Peter and his son, who had uh, MSH6, and Carl and his daughter, who had BRCA. And um, I would encourage all of you to listen, watch the talk. It, it, it was really, it was really a wonderful. Okay, I'll let Elliot tell you what it was. I, I may have a bias. Elliot, how was it? <laughs> uh, it was great. <laughs> what can I say? It was it was actually really fun to be part of that. Um, and I learned a lot about, uh, I mean, in what I got from, from my side of it for, for active surveillance, because I was three plus four, and, you know, on what they had said to us at, in during the talk, what Alicia Morgan said was um, that generally AS patients don't get tested where it's where it's you know when it's advanced cancer is when they is when they the recommendations kick in so and and but but it was interesting because you know we i got to explore it with my son who we had you know never really talked about that part of it he knew i have cancer but he didn't know it never occurred to him that it could be an issue for him yeah I I mean, I think the way, like what I had explained in my talk, where we first realized testing was showing up the most and where we're finding the most mutations is in that metastatic, the advanced setting, where we've been more starting to explore men who are most likely in that active surveillance. So I am starting to test those individuals because those people are having family history. And so we're making sure we're not missing lower risk prostate cancer genes. So you guys have said BRCA1 and 2, ATM, those are our higher risk factors. So there's other genes that we can start testing for that, you know, I've seen HOXB13 and individuals that don't have advanced prostate cancer check 2 mutation. So other genes are showing up and I think that's where the field is going as we are starting to learn more about prostate cancer. I think Definitely, we're still finding more in that um, metastatic high risk setting, but we're still testing other individuals because we, we don't we don't know what we don't know yet right now is how I feel about it. I, I, I had a question that came up. It, it came up while you were giving your talk, which was it's something about if, if if you test negative for all of the mutations. Um, that it still might be worth having your uh, direct family members tested earlier. Is that right? Why would that? Why is that? And how does that work? Yep. So, if if you come to see me and have a prostate cancer that's in active surveillance, 
and test completely negative for a panel of genes. So I, I usually do like a 34 gene panel, but you know, you were diagnosed at age 53 and you have sons. Based off of guidelines, I still don't know why you were diagnosed at 53. So in order to protect your sons and protect your family, I would want your son to start prostate cancer screening at age 45. I'd start younger than typical to make sure I'm not missing some risk factors that we haven't picked up from this genetic test because we know it's not the end all say all of prostate cancer risk. So there's that scenario because I, I feel like I take that question in potentially two ways. So that answers one way that I think you're answer, asking that. The other way is that in the same same guy, same cancer, 53, but he has a sister who had breast cancer at age 40. He tests negative. Sister has not done genetic testing. I'd still want to test sister because there still could be something hereditary in the family that we're missing. And the man's cancer happened by chance or we can't explain it. So there's times when I still recommend genetic testing for other family members. If I see other cancers that can still be concerning or um, his, his test result doesn't answer the question for the entire family. Hopefully that covered both areas. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, can, I, can, I, can I get back in with another question? Um, sure. Um, question is, you know, how well educated about genetics is the physician uh, population? And how receptive are physicians to, specifically urologists, to using genetic testing? And do they put much credence into the results? Oh, wow. Okay. So that's a lot to unpack. So um, <laughs> I think, I think that's, that's hard to answer because it truly depends on if the physician that you know is up on genetics and because prostate cancer genetics has become a newer area in the last five plus years, it's very possible that urologists and physicians in the urology space are not as comfortable with genetics as maybe physicians in other fields that I've worked with. And I've noticed that I've had, I've done more education, which is fine, but I think it's the good thing is that they've been very receptive and they're interested in learning about it. Um, I think a tip of what you can do if you want to bring this up to your physician to say, I saw a talk about genetic counseling and testing. What do you think about that? Could you refer me to somebody and see what they say? And um, if they don't have a good response to that, you can always find a genetic counselor on your own. We have a website through the National Society of Genetic Counselors or nfgc.org. I can put it in the chat if you want. And you can put your zip code in and find a genetic counselor and contact them yourself. You can self-refer. So if if you're, you know, I think you know this better than me, you as patients have the have to empower yourself to take care of yourself because sometimes us in the medical field don't have all the answers and you this is your life and you have to 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 take that next step sometimes if if you're not getting the answers that you want you got to find that second opinion or that that next person that can help you um i don't know if there's a lot of urologists who are actually doing this type of testing they may be um, I know they're more in the practice of doing some of the other type testing like the Prolaris and which is also considered genetic type testing um, doing germline testing they may be but you know I I think they hopefully they're working with a genetic professional as well to help them interpret some things that can get complicated um, because there are definitely complicated results that come up um, in my field. And that's why, that's why my physicians are glad I'm there because they wouldn't know what to do with it. And I have time to deal with it. It's my job. My full-time job is to just understand it. Um, there's just too much for the medical oncologist and the urologist to be trying to understand the entire 
genetics field because things are changing so rapidly in my field that there's just no way. Um, so I think it's hard for me to answer that with saying that like, no, they're not educated or yes, they're educated. I think there are some who are very educated and there are some who are trying to educate and there's some who don't want to know. And I think if you want your doctor to know, or if you're interested, you need to empower yourself to find somebody who knows the topic. Hopefully that well, answers I, that. I would, I would put that a little more in ANCAN terms and be your own best advocate. As we like <laughs> there you go. Here. Um, and, and it's so funny you talk about this because we're, we're dealing with one of our dearest volunteers right now who desperately needs a second round of somatic testing. And um, we've had to support him to put a lot of pressure on his medical oncologist to get it. And she finally agreed today. But um, she's turning around saying, oh, we don't need it. Or, you know, it doesn't tell us anything. We think she's wrong. And we also think it's like chicken soup. I mean, it can't hurt, hurt and it certainly might help. Um, I, I want to give you some perspective good news um, for you, which is that um, I'm fortunate enough to serve on the patient council, patient community council for foundation medicine. And one oh. of the things we've been, I've been pushing, and I think they're going to take up, is to incorporate a germline test along with a somatic test so that we can identify if um, these mutations that are often inherited, um, whether it comes from a, a germline source or inherited or, or a somatic source. And that would just make that life is, a little bit easier oh for everybody. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That is like the golden goose. I mean, right. I, I know that physicians are ordering foundation medicine and other testing, but they're they're just not seeing the things that I need to know and so it would be amazing if like I could just order one test and cover everything for all of it I, know, um, I, I did get an announcement today from foundation medicine I got an email today that they're like color coding that hey these particular results are potentially concerning for germline so they're calling it out better than the example I showed you where it was like I saw it clear as day, but not everybody sees that BRCA2 and says, this person needs germline. So well, baby steps, no promises, baby steps. Lindy, no promises, but that, <laughs> I, can I can tell you that I personally have been working with them on it. And we've had a couple of sessions um, where I've consulted with them on it. So, so we're heading in that direction, but it actually brings up a, a good question that's raised by one of our advanced guys. Um, who said that he was tested by Invite, and then he had somatic testing, and the somatic testing showed up SPOP, SPOP, but that never came up in the Invite test. Now, um, what does he do? Um, does it have any clinical implications, et cetera? Of course, you know, my first response is, well, maybe, I don't know the Invite panel. I don't know if SPOP is on the is in the Invite panel, so they may not have even have been looking for it. Um, but what what are your comments on that? So um, I'm trying to type the like the National Society of Genetic Counseling. Give me one second. Okay. Um, this is probably the most complicated topic when I speak to medical oncology to say to them. When you do a foundation medicine test and it does not show BRCA mutations, it doesn't show findings, it does not mean they don't have a hereditary mutation. There is not coverage. I finally, I, I not on a good note, but I finally tested somebody who had Lynch and it did not show up on their their foundation one report and the oncologist like lost his mind. And it's like, I thought I told you this, like this, and it's because the technique of what they're looking for in foundation one does not go as deep as what they look at the germline, like the germline testing. We go, they're they, they very detailed. Um, so it's a difference of the actual technique. So that's there. So it sounds like the question you asked me is reverse. Something was picked up on foundation one that was not picked up on the Um I almost wonder though, 
I, I didn't recognize the gene that you said. It almost sounds like it's not a hereditary gene that was picked up at Foundation One that wasn't picked up in in vitae, or maybe I misheard. What gene, what, what was the result of? SPOP, SPOP. It is I'm a not gene familiar that, with SPOP. Um, it's a gene that shows up from time to time in, um, in um, metastatic prostate cancer. Okay, so, it, I mean, so it, that it, typically it, is not a hereditary germline okay. gene. So it probably yeah. is a driver of prostate cancer and is somatic. So that's why it wasn't picked up because it's yeah. not on testing panels. Right. So on, so so it's that that's also to say that it's unlikely that SPOP would be a hereditary gene that mutation that could be passed on. Correct. I can, I need to look up a little bit more about SPOP because I'm not familiar okay. with it, but it's not one that I think of when I think of hereditary prostate cancer, okay. unless well, it's like I, a brand new, like yeah. off the. <laughs> I think John has his answer. I think that's that, that's close enough. We don't want to give you more work. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I'm always, you know, when you're researchers, like you're always wanting to hear what other people are thinking about. So I don't mind, um, but yeah. Perfect. Okay. Any Thank other last you. minute questions, you guys? <laughs> well, somebody asked whether, whether you yourself have been genetically tested for some reason. You want to get into my, my personal? <laughs> well, you, you signed the HIPAA page when you came in, right? So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So no, 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 I, I, you know, I like to try to be an open book because I feel like my patients share all their business with me. So when people ask me things, I, I'm not afraid to answer. So I've done 23 Me only for the fact because I wanted to know what I was doing so that people ask me questions all the time about it. Um, I've done cancer genetic testing as well because I have family history. So it was an interesting experience to go through. So I do know that anxiety of what it feels like to get wait for results to come back for that. Um, I did test negative, but I had testing done in 2010. So I probably should do updated testing because there's a lot of things that I only, <clears throat> at that time there were only 25 genes that were really uh, available to test for, so to say. So if I was feeling really motivated, I would do more, but I've kind of let that sail at this point for me, at this point. So hopefully that was enough personal information. Um, I have two I, kids who are going to bed. <laughs> Howard, I just want to add something very quickly about color because um, Lindsay said nice things about color before. And if anybody is thinking about a color test, um, I had an experience where a good friend of mine from many years ago, when I lived in Romania, had tested with colon cancer. And then she wrote me about a year or two years ago, and she told me that she had endometrial cancer. And I said, you know, Carmen, I think you should go and get germline tested. Now, it's kind of hard to do that when you live in Romania, but she has a daughter who lives in the valley, in the Silicon Valley. And when she was over here, she got tested through color. And the point I want to make is that color will not give you the results without having, well, they give you the results through a germline counselor if you have not, through a genetic counselor if you have not ordered it through your doctor. So you get to talk to a person like Lindsay if you're not going to talk to your doctor, if you've just ordered it um, because you, you want to know. And that's exactly what happened with Carmen. And she asked me to sit in on the on the research, and as it turned out, she she did carry Lynch syndrome, which is what I suspected. Um, what was interesting is her doctors in Romania didn't even know what we were talking about, um, and and did didn't they just didn't have the knowledge. And I forget which gene she she carries. It might have been MLH one. I forget which I forget which one it was. But uh, now she knows that um, she has an inherited Lynch syndrome. She did that through color, and the results were given to her by a genetic counselor. 
Yeah, and there are other labs that are, are doing that type of um, setup for patient. I think Invite is now doing, you know, if you go on the Invite website and you want to self-order, you can you can do that as well, and they will link you up with a genetic counselor who works at Invite. Um, the last thing that I will probably say is fun fact about color is, you know, that was set up by Mary Claire King, who discovered the BRCA gene. So just so you know, like where that lab and where that test is coming from. So it's got Whoa. good history and good, good researchers wait, there. Wait a, minute, wait, a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. I thought I thought Ellen Ashworth had a hand in that. Who Probably. I, I mean, she's she's. She's got a, I mean, Mary Claire King's got a piece there for sure. Because <laughs> oh, okay. I happen to know Alan, who's a, who's a terrific guy, and he actually was on sure, our, yeah. when, when we did the talk ovarian cancer, um, he actually spoke up on that. So, um, so well, I'll add, I'll add Mary Claire to Alan, Alan Ashworth when I reference that. Well, I guess Lindsay is saying that the, the, the color has good genes. There you go. <laughs> right. joke. Very good, I, but, but, but uh, you know, I, I want to uh, let the guys know that uh, you need to get going now. I want to thank you for speaking, and I want to thank uh, Richard May for recommending you as a speaker. And I hope uh, the, if we want to do another program, we can invite you back. So I yes. think I, I would love to. This was really good. And I feel like I learned some and it's always good to hear from from you all. So thanks, Richard. It's uh, good to see you. <laughs> Lind Lindsay, really, right. thanks again. We, we ended up with over yep. 60 folks coming into the call. So that's good. Oh, good. You, set a, you, so you, you set a world's record. So. Oh. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I feel like that's hard to top. So I'm going to go to bed feeling good on a high there. <laughs> thank you, Lindsay. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll say good night to everybody, but the team will hang on, please. Yep. Thanks again. Our pleasure.